a lot about things that can't be replicated again uh, in certain art forms just because of how quickly the art form moves on or because how it's been monetized is different now. Uh, last episode, I was talking about the experience of playing a beat em up arcade game in the mid 90s or the or the late 90s when you couldn't get versions of those on home console it was like you had to be a real computer nerd in order to work any type of emulation software i don't know of any emulation software that existed in 1998 and at eight years old i certainly couldn't handle it so the only way that you could get the experiences the full experiences of some games some brilliant games that i loved uh, like the X-Men arcade game or the Simpsons beat 'em up game was to, you know, go, uh, feed the fucking quarters into the machine. Uh, and so you had to, like, commit to it, too. You know, and I wasn't good enough at these games to do runs where I would use a minimal amount of quarters. But um, because you also, you know, you know, you couldn't get Let's Plays of it, you can never access this game footage. Once you finally got to these areas, often it was the first time you were seeing them. So was the, there was this, like, genuine moment of what I would describe as awe, you know, because it's, I've never been here before. This is a part of the game. I've no, it's, a, it's sort of replicated in the most recent I Think You Should Leave season with the egg sketch. Whereas I've never gotten here in this game before. There's this moment of, of discovery um, that I think was very powerful um, w with that format of uh, entertainment distribution because, you know, you're... you're uh, ability to experience the whole thing was limited by your skill at the game but also how much you could invent invest in it i guess in a way it's sort of like a precursor to the hated microtransactions but <laughs> there's a there's a more organic quality to that sort of arcade thing um because you know that that entertainment was so controlled and it was like a more special thing that you were able to experience something that was in the arcade because often you know they had better resolution than home consoles they could do things that home consoles couldn't do so there was that extra bit of prestige or attraction to that and uh you know there are still some arcades there's still a, a market for it but obviously that waned with the massive explosion of home console gaming um but uh, something I wanted to talk about that's also in that vein, and also in the vein of, like, video games. I guess I, I say art in general, but I'm, uh, I am I guess I'll be talking about other mediums as well and what they do differently than video games and how you convey the idea that I'm going to talk about through video games. But I want to talk about emptiness, uh, specifically in video games. You know, when a video game takes a lot of time for you to get anywhere, and... Uh, it's a feature or, you know, uh, even if it doesn't take a lot of time, there is like a, a there's like an empty quality to the world, uh, which is uh, sort of something that I think you don't see a lot. in. It. I mean, I'm sure you see it in tons of indie games that replicate this quality. But, you know, this is uh, in mainstream gaming. This has become less of a thing because in the early 2000s, you know, there was sort of this race to come up with big expansive games um but you know you had still had limited technology of the time you know you still had ps2 technology or gamecube technology so you you um you, you couldn't you, you made these expansive worlds but there had to be like a lot of just empty space if you wanted that but um the empty space you know if it was done right it, it would become part of the game it would become part of the emotional quality of the game and um i i think you see a lot of examples of this from like the ps2 era but less examples as games sort of evolved and become became way more overstuffed with content because you know way more overstuffed with shit to do you got it around every corner and around every nook and cranny there's some fucking shit to do and that's become, you know, open world game, which you maybe would associate with being like, oh, this is all about empty space and, you know, uh, taking in uh, vistas and, you know, allowing for a sense of pause or in just enjoying uh, the images, the, the multimedia experience that you get 
Uh, but uh, no, there's always just a lot more fucking shit to do, something to collect, you know. It has uh, become that uh, everyone, you know, called rare games collect the thons, right? Uh, that was like the big criticism of like Donkey Kong 64 is that it's an exhausting collect a thon. But that's really, you know, that's prefigured our love of open world games, which are all now exhausting collect a thons, which I love. You know, I love exhausting collect a thons. That's my bread and butter. I'm not, I'm not complaining. But I think it's funny that we're in this uh, era of open world gaming. We have, uh, you know, stuff like uh, uh, Elden Ring, of course, and e Breath of the Wild, and uh, most recently Tears of the Kingdom. But even though they're, they are these, like, big expansive maps, they lack that real sense of emptiness that games just had to have in, in a previous era due to hardware limitations. And, you know, uh, the idea behind it is uh, you have this uh, arms race of of content production where you're, you're wanting people to like now spend 150 hours on a game as opposed to like 30 hours on a game. So um, that has resulted in these um, curiously full games, curiously unempty games. And uh, it's sad for me because... Uh, I really liked the quality of a lot of these early 2000s empty games. There's like a spooky quality or what I would say a melancholic quality to some of them. And I, I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about them right now. I, I guess before I say that, there is one modern game which I think captures this feeling and isn't just like an open world game. There's fucking shit everywhere. I got to I think Death Stranding is uh and, and you know that because that is part of the emotional landscape of the game as well i think that is something that i don't know if hideo kojima was influenced by the other games i'm gonna mention but the fact that it takes a while to get somewhere and there's not always shit to interact with on the way there's just long stretches of just you walking and uh i i think but as you become used to that, you become used to sort of the emotional ambience of the game and sort of the the sadness that is that is within it. I, I think uh, emptiness used to convey sadness or used to convey a tone of melancholy or hopelessness. Um, that is like, I'm going to mention The Wind Waker. To me, this is like the most brilliant use of emptiness in games or something that and people like balked it at the time because in the wind waker uh it's this zelda game which you know god i don't know who at nintendo made the decision because there was a lot of pressure on them to do something like twilight princess immediately do like a dark adult zelda you know they had a tech demo for a gamecube zelda and it was closer in visual style to the twilight princess but uh the wind waker it Still looks f fucking great. The cartoony style ages so much better than uh, the somewhat more photorealistic style uh, because it's just uh, timeless. You know, it it translates to every potential generation. Whereas attempting to create something with photorealism will always get better through each generation. But you can't create a better cartoon. You can't create a better simplistic cartoon through each generation. You know, that's why a lot of SNES games still hold up because when uh, you're uh, operating at the peak of your system and the peak of your graphical capabilities, it weirdly has a more timeless quality. Or maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. But The Wind Waker is really good, um, and a, a feature of the game is you sail from island to island, and it takes a really fucking long time <laughs> to sail between these islands. Yeah, there's stuff to do on the way, and there's little islands in between, but it's really empty. It's like they're just minutes of uh, stretches where just nothing happens, and you're just uh, on this horizon. You can't see anything but the sea in front of you, and there's this very lonely quality. It's just you and your talking boat. I guess, you know, you always have your talking boat companion, so that's you know, cuts into that feeling. But, um, yeah, the Wind Waker is like, uh, I, I made a post recently where I was talking about how Tears of the Kingdom, it's funny, they promoted it as this sort of dark, it's, oh, we're going darker for this sequel to Breath of the Wild. 
and then it turns out that no it's really goofy and there are stakes yeah there are stakes but that's not what people like the game for you know whereas breath of the wild i feel people had a lot more investment in the story talking it's breath of the wild is a very fucking sad game as well and one which i think copies the dismalism of wind waker as well because breath of the wild is all about you persisting in a ruined world all of your friends are fucking dead (laughs) <laughs> you know it's it's a really downbeat plot but you know uh ultimately you hold on to hope represented by the lady in the castle who's who's nice uh and uh, uh we we also have that sort of dismalism in wind waker as well where this world is not what it once was you know y- you sort of occupied the the narrow spaces of civilization after an immense calamity even you know ganondorf his motivations in this game are sort of different where he as he's an unrepentant tyrant and basically uh, uh heavy for like you know link to the past or i mean ganondorf's not in link to the past it's ganon but it's always you know it's a pig guy or uh then they introduce ganondorf with the uncomfortable weird islamic associations in in uh ocarina of time it's fine if you don't know in ocarina of time like for some reason a lot of the gerudo stuff who seem vaguely modeled after uh arab cultures uh, they also included the uh star and crescent moon that is sort of associated and i don't know if they meant anything by it but that was like a minor controversy in the game but you know i think being generous to nintendo i I don't think Ganondorf is supposed to be a racist character. Um, and, uh, but, you know, he's very, he's very one dimensional uh, in, in Ocarina of Time. You know, he just, he wants power. He's a Triforce of Power. He's a bad guy. You know, th- there is stuff to be explored. You know, what is, he's, he's the only man in, in a, in a otherwise society of women which is interesting but it's not like an aspect of the game that it really explores um but uh in wind waker ganondorf gets this sort of like uh, just sad story about it i don't remember the broad strokes of what his deal is but um it's not it, it feels like a, a much more human version or one who is sort of resigned to the dismal fate of this world as well and you know, like like Breath of the Wild, you young Link, you are the beacon of hope, and you uh, create the uh, you, you create the paths for the world to open up again, and for civilization to begin anew, and for Hyrule. And there's also like it's another it's you know Zelda is representative of that that purifying light. Um, and uh, I I think this quality of. Uh, empty space in the game underscores the sadness of it underscores the this is all you know there are all these like little points little beacons of hope but in this vast unknowable unforgiving and fundamentally sort of boring ocean but as you're sort of you know and the music's good the music keeps you interested but as as you're just uh going across this ocean especially as a kid the feeling was like you zone out and you start to like think about other stuff you you start your mind starts to wander and suddenly you know you've you've reached somewhere else on the map and and your attention is brought back to it um and to me that sort of mimics the quality of say uh ambient music or uh, even going back to even to be really uh, pretentious and stupid and maybe obvious about it, like uh, one of the great modernist works that a lot of people are familiar with is John Cage's 433, right? And the idea behind that was, oh, it's a silent piece, but no, the, uh, like the real the real intention behind it, or it, I don't know if I, I can ascribe intention to it, but the idea is you stop listening to the piano in front of you and you start listening to the ambiance of the room around you because you know like all things especially if you're doing a live performance there is this dialogue quality to the art that you produce where it's not just what you're playing but also the reverberations of the audience the little coughs the little human moments you know the 
the little fidgets that you can hear, especially when your attention is drawn to it. And then it, the, the same thing happens. Your mind starts to wander. It starts to make strange connections because this sort of long and slow and boring thing is being presented to you as something that you should pay attention to. And we don't usually turn our minds to that. We don't usually think about trying to pay attention to the you know most boring stuff. Usually we reserve that for a type of meditation. But I think you can jog that feeling through artwork as well. And I think that was the quality that I really loved about Wind Waker, that I really loved about the huge amount of downtime between islands, was that it would have this 433-like quality where you would just sort of zone out and you would glaze over and you would start thinking about the vastness of it and the loneliness of it. And um, I, I'm sure, you know, it was done because, you know, you couldn't dot the landscape with like a million islands due to the hardware limitations of it. So you had to get really sparse, but you wanted to make this big ass game, right? Because, you know, you have to uh, you have to explore the limits of your system. You know, Nintendo always you know, had... Uh, a desire to innovate as well and you know you can only repeat the same zelda formula so many times before uh you start wanting to present it in different and perhaps even radically different ways um but um i i think uh yeah that that is just a quality we're, we're never going to get again because um if they made a type of Wind Waker today, there would be just so much more shit dotting the landscape because that would be the expectation. There'd be an island like uh, every little micro square of the map. There'd be uh, something to do. Um, and, you know, there is other stuff. You know, you could, there's a lot of fishing. Who doesn't like fishing? Um, but, um, yeah, that... that I, I think also because maybe there's a fear that games uh, gamers are more impatient now this is certainly not true of indie game. You know, there's tons of indie games which use this. I don't know any of them <laughs> because I'm not a huge indie gamer, but I, I think people understand uh, the quality of these types of games and uh, have sought to replicate it in stuff that's more unbound from the studio system. Um, but um, it's funny, uh, and Breath of the Wild absolutely... Tonally, it is the most similar to Wind Waker. I've already said that. But it was this... What was great about Breath of the Wild is that it was this combination of every sort of past Zelda trope, but it presented in a completely new way. Like, the the thing that I always loved about it is that it, it replicated the first Zelda, the very first Legend of Zelda game, where you could just walk to a screen and be suddenly very outmatched. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, this is terrible. And it... it and in that, it captures that sense of danger, that sense that anything could happen, and really, it does something to your adrenaline and jogs that feeling of actual peril, which I think uh, was this great thing for Breath of the Wild to bring back. Whereas, you know, Zelda games had become very linear for a while. Usually, you wouldn't have to progress to the area with harder enemies until you were prepared to do so, but... Um, yeah, I, I love that quality. It has the tone of Wind Waker. It has the uh, the imminent peril of the first Zelda game. You know, it has the... Uh, it, it, I guess... It, and the other thing it innovated was just, you know, maybe just finding points on a map and doing puzzles. You know, <laughs> maybe that's enough. Uh, which then every open world game, including, you know, Elden Ring, really, really took to heart and started uh, copying. Um, but, uh, you know, nothing, the thing about Breath of the Wild, which is interesting to me, is that I find it to be, um, it, it doesn't have that same quality of emptiness of Zelda because there's just always something there. There's always a Korok seed or there's always some sort of item that you can collect. Uh, that is just, you know, three seconds away. There's always some shit to do, some shit to distract you. So you're never really can get into that meditative state uh, because you're always constantly foraging. You know, it is, con it is a game about constantly trying to build up your resources and gathering items. So you can never have that moment where you're just waiting and waiting and waiting for a really long time in order to progress the game. Which some people would, you know, I'm sure people hated those uh, 
long boat sequences in Zelda, but it just it, it's just a feeling that I would love to see again, you know, uh, in in maybe more mainstream games. But uh, I I can understand why it might not be as popular. Um, speaking of a dismal world, I think uh, right on the cusp of when you started just seeing more shit in the games uh, is uh, Dark Souls. And, you know, Dark Souls is, is kind of a similar plot to, to Legend of Zelda. You know, something has happened uh, that has uh, ruined the world and uh, the, the world has died and you're sort of left fighting uh, amongst the pieces of the world and there's uh there's some lady uh who's going to help you become stronger or is the beacon of hope you know in dark souls it's the fire keeper arguably um there's sort of that false version of that in guinevere as well but there's a lot of empty space in uh the first dark souls game uh, which is what I like. There's a lot of times where you just have to walk across a very long thing, especially in An Orlando, which was uh, obviously the big graphical set piece of the game. You know, everybody loves An Orlando. Everyone loves Ornstein and Smell. But there's that sequence when you're progressing from the first bonfire uh, you get in uh, An Orlando in that little room with the other firekeeper, and you're going across the bridge. You have to fight a gargoyle. But that bridge is really fucking long. And you can cross it a few times, like if you're just playing casually. And it really takes you a long time to get to the other side. But And there are no enemies once you defeat the gargoyle. So y all you can do is just walk and look at the world around you. Which I think is was sort of intentional on their part. is because like we put a fuck ton of work into this goddamn elaborate European city. You better look at this shit. You know, you know, which is also, I, I think that's also like an interesting move on their part to then shroud it in darkness. If you, you know, spoilers for Dark Souls, if you end up defeating uh, Gwendolyn, you know, then you can't see shit anymore <laughs> and you can't see their beautiful architecture. I mean, that's part of the, the narrative of the game, right? Is that uh, that melancholy you, you see from seeing these grandiose structures reduced to what inevitably they, they become you know it's it's always the ozymandias uh th that is sort of the theme of dark souls you know it's always reiterating the Oz ozymandias theme you know this these tree these trunks trunks of legs in the desert you know and fighting some guy who is his beyond his uh reckoning because he's just so fucking old now and all he knows how to do is you know fight um but yeah, I think there's a lot of empty space in the first Dark Souls. Uh, I, Elden Ring, there's no fucking empty space in Elden Ring. There's always fucking shit to do. It's like this huge world. Yeah, and yeah, I guess in Liurnia there's empty space, but there's always enemies or stuff to do. There's like, you never get more than three seconds of just uh, running. I guess you can, you know, avoid stuff, but um, there's not like a really big true emptiness like in uh, even the first Dark Souls game, which, you know, there's emptiness in it because of the hardware limitations. Like uh, Tomb of Giants is like a great example. It's like, we don't want to render shit, you know. <laughs> We're having, we, we've reached our budget by the end of the game, the famously, you know, not so good end game of the first Dark Souls game, which I love actually, because I think it plays into the themes of like, uh, y you know, even if the bosses are shitty, that's the theme of the game is that they, they suck. The, <laughs> these, all these Lord souls, they suck now, you know, better chaos. Yeah. You're not getting a good boss fight. They suck now, which is would have been a good boss fight, but guess what? She sucks now because of time. Time has rendered <laughs> her terrible. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I like the late game of dark souls. Actually, I'm, I'm contrarian on that, but, um, yeah, you, you have some level like tomb of giants where it's just like, uh, we ain't rendering shit. You know, we got to find some way to stretch this budget. So, you know, it's, here's a dark level. Or, you know, it's uh, in Crystal Caves, Invisible Bridges. That's how we're doing it. You know, you got to you gotta find some sort of cost-cutting measures to give the game a little more padding. Um, uh, not that I mind that stuff, but um, uh, because I think it does that sort of sense of emptiness creates the same melancholic quality as Wind Waker. 
that sort of, um, I don't know, almost a, a used to used to the horror effect in Dark Souls because there's something very um, fucked up about an empty world. It's uh, I I would describe it as the quality of being in a mall at nighttime, and you know nobody's there, and you're seeing all these shops where you see all the the facades and the mannequins in the immediate window, but behind them is darkness. And there is this unreal quality to it that I, I became very apparent in the horror literature of uh, the internet, especially because you had stuff like the back rooms, uh, the idea that there are these sort of, or, or you know, in us, that underground network of, of, uh, of tunnels, you know, the, the idea that there are these vast, empty sort of interior spaces that, are, are sort of what video games are or, or what early 3d video games were where you had these spaces but you couldn't fill them with too much shit so um yeah but that has that dreamlike or nightmare like nightmare like quality where it's like i'm in an incomplete world i'm in a seemingly limited and incomplete world which is this uh you know, I think whether or not you believe in the simulation, it's fun to imagine how terrifying that would be suddenly being equipped with the knowledge that everything you were, there is no, you know, flesh. You know, what reality is, is not this collection of organic atoms, but rather something that is really even more ethereal. And, you know, you question your mortality now. You know, how much would you question your mortality if you knew you were just. A, a strand of data there was even less to you than meets the eye um and uh <laughs> it's fun talking about it because now the other game i'm going to talk about from the early 2000s which is a game that i love you know it marks me as juvenile i haven't played it in a while but uh, uh kingdom hearts had this had this quality i really enjoyed if you know anything about this body listening for a long time i love kingdom hearts it's a ter- it's terrible but um yeah it got it hooks it's got it hooks in me when i i was 12 years old and you know um but i think because there is like that real horror element to it the, when kingdom hearts 3 came out which was very malign people didn't like kingdom hearts 3 i didn't like kingdom hearts 3 because combat is the, the fun thing that's fun about kingdom hearts games and usually when you like would jump or do air combos there are little pauses or cooldown periods and that would determine how well you could do in a fight scenario is by you learning to manage these cooldown periods but with kingdom hearts 3 the combat was just zip 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 there were no cooldown periods you were just going from one thing to another which sort of simplified it and made it less fun which is to me that that was the thing that that killed that game more than anything else was that um oversimplification of the combat in a game where the combat is already very simplified so it was like yeah why you know who i guess i guess you have different expectations or maybe it was just tetsuya nomura being like i want to just have my character do cool shit because you know I, i can see him wanting to do that uh either way it's fine it's fine but um a one thing that people would praise about kingdom hearts 3 is that oh there's N- a lot more NPCs in the worlds now. It's not as unpopulated as the first two games were because they had more to work with. They could do more with the the PS the PS4 hardware. Did it come out for PS4? Yeah, I guess it came out for. I, I have not. I don't. I don't remember. But um, yeah. Oh, there were more NPCs. It's good. There's more populated. It's there's more verisimilitude it's weird to want verisimilitude in kingdom hearts first of all it's funny yeah i'm more i'm more entrenched in this really cartoonish world you know uh but i i think uh the the effect of the first game where there's barely any npcs in this world they're empty it's mostly just enemy encounters but that really created like uh, especially for like be, me being like a, a gay 12 year old you know a gay sensitive 12 year old you know I'm like this is spooky everybody's dead you know in the first cutscene of kingdom hearts which you never really see again you see a guy get fucking murdered by heartless and then become one and 
the game never really goes to that horror extent again you know you get turned into a heartless but you know you get revived sorry spoilers for kingdom hearts if you haven't played this <laughs> this funny this funny ass 20 year old game um but uh yeah but part of the emptiness of the world really underscores just how like how fucked you are you know the heartless have taken over you you have these small patches of civilization but they're just infested with demons as well demons that don't die that you have to constantly be routing out because they they respawn and you know uh so it's this it, it is this real horror scenario and not only that you go to all these familiar disney worlds that you saw when you were a child and all of them are being routed out by these demons all of them are empty and you know the only people that are left are, are sort of these these characters that w we have in our memory these powerful ip characters but you know they don't seem to be noticing that the world is being harrowed or emptied out i i mean they eventually come around to it but it's this it, it's this theme of depletion you know like the world is slowly dying or every world is slowly dying and you don't notice it happening around you. Um, and that created a really cool emotional effect, I thought, because you didn't have NPCs, because uh, of the limitations, because the hardware, you just couldn't render them. It, it had to go with this emotional tone of emptiness and loneliness in, in like a, a same but different way than The Wind Waker and uh, a lot of the games at the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's something that eventually in Kingdom Hearts 2, you know, it's all about you living in a simulation. It starts out, you're Roxas, and you're living in a simulation, and sort of, you know, uh, really... And it's sort of like a... a in a way, it's a not a bold message, I shouldn't say, but it's like a, a really harrowing message because it sort of argues that this piece of code that was infused with the personality is, in fact, a real person. And it is a tragedy when they die and they become absorbed into the host body. You know, they can still look out from their, their sunken place behind Sora's eyes and cry for their lost life, which is, you know, that's like a... And, you know, part of that... Uh, part of that message, that sort of feeling of emptiness and loneliness and searching for a connection across these harrowed worlds, you know, these hollow bastions, you know, these hollow bastions, you know, uh, that is that is really uh, part of the game. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was totally betrayed by the fact that this modern sensibility is like, we have all these words, got to put a lot of shit in them gotta put all this shit in them to do or else you know you're not getting the most bang out of your buck for these fucking games um i, I i'm sure there are modern games that use i already mentioned death stranding which uh is one of those uh which i think has um sort of a very it, it utilizes the open world in a way that i don't know maybe wasn't done since grand theft auto I mean, that's what's interesting about um, the sort of like the early Grand Theft Auto games. There was always a lot of shit to do, but you were less compelled to interact with that shit than you were to just, you know, drive a la around listening to the radio. There was sort of a more atmospheric quality. There was less of... You could play the game, but the collectathon was not, you know, the, the main feature of it. Especially like Vice City where you had never seen, like, a city in that much detail before. Like, what you would want to do in the game is just sort of drive around listening to the funny radio and shit. Um, and I feel like the games became a lot more uh, incentivized on, you know, overstuffing it itself with content and, you know, in, in a way losing some of that. I mean, there is a lot of empty space in GTA V, but, you know, there is no... I would hardly describe those games as sort of like melancholy or trying to evoke that feeling. If maybe um, I, there is sort of, if I would say there is any quality to the GTA games, uh, it's funny that they have these intense crime plots, but they're they're relaxing. They're they're like chill games. You know, you ride around in your car listening to stuff. 
you commit crimes and there are no consequences. They're humor, you're humorous. They're often very satirical. It's like, uh, to me, like if there's if the emptiness is utilized in any way in those games, it's about inducing a sense of sort of almost like Walden-like well-being. This Thoreau, like oh, you're reveling in the, in the nature and the majesty of this world. And it is especially fun because there are no true consequences to your actions. So you can really, you know, uh, you have that feeling, that unbound feeling, uh, which is, you know, counter to the way that emptiness is used in uh, in the other games that I've mentioned. Emptiness in those other games is sort of used as a horror element or as a, an element to underscore uh, a sense of j just lack in the game they which they had to lean into so um yeah yeah it can be used in many different ways is i guess what i'm saying but i like the way that it is used in the kingdom hearts or in the in the wind waker because i like it when you have these cartoony games that have this you know deep sadness to them there is this really deep core of sadness to, to these surprisingly like oh goofy you know <laughs> Donald goofy because it's all about how you know your friends come under the thrall of this time traveling groomer and your only your only thing that you can do is just sacrifice your body in order to stop it you know you have to purge yourself in order to uh, get rid of it all in order to stop the world from being harrowed and that's like it, it's a fucked up thing Sora of course is Jesus you know he dies he dies for everyone's sins uh, I actually sort of you know I, I didn't mind how uh, spoilers for Kingdom Hearts 3 but I didn't mind how the story ended in that way that the whole story is just you ungrooming your friends <laughs> progressively getting rid of Xehanort's uh, influence over all of them and then finally, you know, using what life you have left in order to purge that evil from the universe uh, eventually. Because, you know, lots of games there is no, like, uh, in a game uh, <laughs> that's aimed at a very young audience, you wouldn't think that, oh, the protagonist dies? <laughs> he dies? Oh, my God. That doesn't usually happen. Especially in this game, which has fucking Donald and Goofy. Gorsh, Donald. <laughs> he, he died for our sins, Donald. Yeah, they should start a religion around Sora in the, in the Kingdom Hearts universe. They should have Sora crucified. Everyone uh, wears crucified Soras around their necks. That's funny to me. That's funny to me, these Kingdom Hearts jokes. What, you're not laughing? You're not laughing at this pithy Kingdom Hearts humor? Uh, <laughs> um, another game that I wanted to talk about that uses emptiness in games to its logical extent is uh, Penn and Teller's Desert Bus. I forget. It was off a weird collection of PC games I think they had in the 90s. And uh, there was one that's very famous because it's often considered, you know, Penn and Teller uh just through fucking around made one of the the best experimental video games of all time which is desert bus where the goal of the game is you need to ride on the highway from la to las vegas and uh this, which is a famously punishing stretch of highway because it's really boring and there's nothing to do and it's the same flat desert landscape all throughout it there's like very funny joke in swingers where they're talking about yeah let's drive to las vegas and they're all in la and they're like gung-ho and they're like cheering for the first you know <laughs> first bit of it and then it cuts to them just exhausted <laughs> in front of like, going in this highway with this very samey landscape and so Desert Bus, what you have to do is you have to ride the bus through the desert in order to get to the gig. And then uh, you can't just put it on autopilot, though. You have to keep turning the wheel periodically to the left or else you will crash. And you just do this for six hours. <laughs> and uh, you get to Las Vegas. And then uh, what's your reward? Then you have to go back. <laughs> and you do that. You drive for another six hours. And... Um, I, I think yeah, inadvertently they they created a, a game that was a, a, a very early commentary on Ludo narrative and the effect that a video game can have on you, the emotional quality of inducing 
that boredom. Um, and I don't know if anyone ever completed Desert Bus. I'm sure somebody has. I'm sure there's like Desert Bus long play you can look at on YouTube. Do should someone should do a speed run of Desert Bus, which I guess is impossible because it's a six hour long auto scroller. Um, yeah, they should just do they should just do a Desert Bus charity stream. Uh, that would be good, actually. Like, you could do that for 12 hours. You could uh, 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 complete that. It'd be funny if you crashed, like, four hours into your desert bus <laughs> uh, charity stream. Um, yeah, a and I think, yeah, that's another funny quality. of the, It's game over once you crash, so you can invest a lot of time into it. But if you stop paying attention for one second, uh, <laughs> then it's over for you. Which is another way to, uh, like, use emptiness in games, not for a sense of melancholy but for a sense of like a cross between boredom and peril where it's like what you're fighting against is the boredom because you know you will die if you get too bored so it's forcing you more violently into that meditative state where it's just like, pay attention to the boring thing or you'll die pay attention to the boring thing or you'll die and you know how like life you know though that is that's basically what being an adult is and that's maintenance as an adult is now you need to pay attention to all these boring things your bills your health it's eating enough vegetables you know it's your prostate you know check your prostate you know <laughs> you know pay all, pay attention to all these things or you'll die uh you didn't have the tolerance or patience to uh pay attention to them as a kid but you know as as you grow up uh, you learn to to deal with that sense of constantly being made on edge by having to pay attention to these like really listless and long and unrewarding <laughs> passages of time. Um, and uh, I I think you know that's also uh, I I think uh, that's what these games underscore too is that sense of emptiness or lack of belonging or the long journeys or being forced to pay attention through boring sequences you know talking about kingdom hearts being forced to pay attention through boring sequences those gummy ship sequences am i right people am i right those gummy ship sequences yeah who cares but yeah all those games you know wind waker and kingdom hearts are both about your passage into adulthood you know link takes the mantle of the hero uh, after he uh, reaches his 13th birthday and you know he must uh s s he, he gets his bar mitzvah link gets his bar mitzvah and then he sets out onto the open sea as you do after your bar mitzvah in order to find responsibility and become a man and that's sort of what kingdom hearts is about at the end of the day it's about sora putting away the childish things of the past and becoming a man <laughs> And doing the ultimate thing a man would do, which is sacrifice yourself so you can uh, depose Leonard Nimoy Xehanort and uh, save all your buddies. Um, one thing, just an, an aside about Penn and Teller, this has nothing to do with emptiness in games, but maybe I can tie it back to it. Is um, I was thinking a lot about uh, their movie Tim's Vermeer, if you've ever seen it. Um, it's this movie about this guy, Tim Jennison, Tim, I forget his last name, but he, uh, is friends with Penn and Teller. He made it big, uh, in the nineties doing the video editing software, video toaster, which is a very funny way to get rich making video toaster, <laughs> but he's sort of like this, uh, eccentric, like logical engineer type. And, uh, he had this theory about Vermeer and how uh how he he could see like the, something about the use of light or the really organic quality of vermeer's paintings uh there was something about it that evidenced a technique that was just beyond you know going from his eye he thought vermeer was being aided by some sort of technical help like a camera obscura because with a camera obscura, you can uh, have a dark sheet in a dark room and you put a little pinhole projector in it. And then you have the image that is reflected upside down through the little pinhole. And, you know, you can use this uh, early this when was Vermeer 17th centuries. I don't, I don't know which century, but you can use this old technology in order to help you with your painting. 
and uh, t- this Tim character, who is a technologist, I think he sees a real value in that because you know you're always trying to emotionally and morally justify what you do. I am a technologist, you know. Does that mean I am precluded from making real art just because it has this foundation in a technological practice as opposed to something that someone would call more organic? And um, so uh, the, Tim sets out through throughout this movie to completely recreate uh, a Vermeer using techniques that would have been available to him at the time. And the thing that he discovers is um, he uses a mirror and he finds that if he uses a mirror and paints around the edge of the mirror, he can do color matching to the color he sees in the mirror that is projected from uh, a a live action scene behind him. And, you know, he practices, he gets good. He has no formal training in painting, but he has sort of a lot of patience and a very... Uh, technical and observational mind so he's able to use this technique in order to do these fairly photorealistic paintings right away and he practices with that technique and eventually he sets up a live scene with a Vermeer painting and he wants to get it exactly right so he like spends a lot of money like there's like a type of uh, instrument I think it's called a virginal or like a, it's a type of harpsichord or like a piano with like very this very intricate seahorse scroll work painted on it and he he commissions that exact instrument and builds it you know he's he uh convinces his children to model for him while he's painting and it's like this arduous labor intensive it takes him like years to do but eventually he is able to do a pretty shockingly uh accurate recreation of this vermeer uh by using this mirror technique something that would have been available to vermeer at the time and they show it to david hockney the famous painter david hockney who i i think uh also is somebody that wrote a lot about uh, there's sort of an opposition to uh, technology or the use of uh technological aids in art because it's seen as cheating or something um I don't know if, if this argument would extend to AR, AI art, which I think is something different entirely. I wonder what Tim Jennison would have to say about that, but um, I hope it doesn't. But I, I think the film is interesting to me because I think it really argues that if you're able to create beautiful art using something that is, you know, beyond your skill level or if you, you have found some sort of technological workaround to creating something that has an emotional quality even if, you know, it doesn't come directly from this organic uh, place in your mind or it doesn't come from your brain interpreting this information, but rather you going through a technical process. There's no reason why that art, that type of art should be precluded uh, from or, or seen as lesser than than other art, even though there might be some pretension in art. I, I don't really... I, I, I like if you whatever you use to generate something you know who cares you know as long as it's interesting you know there's no I mean that's maybe AI art could be interesting a- AI art could be interesting if somebody uses the medium in a cool way but usually what you see are these like it was this is Wes Anderson but Star Wars you know these really sort of bland premises um, I'm sure the technology will get to a point where it will just become ubiquitous and you'll have to use it. Maybe I don't want to do that, but um, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, I, I think the movie really argues that, um, you know, there there are not lesser practice. Just, just because something is generated in a specific way does not make it a lesser work of art. I mean, um, but in a way, <laughs> in a way it does. I mean, especially in this case, because it's like, you have answered the least interesting question about the art in some ways, which is, oh, how was it made? Oh, through this technical process? Okay, that's great. But, you know, what is it about, though? What is the emotional quality of the art that you're responding to? Not just, you know, the way it's made. Unless, you know, maybe you're also arguing that the way it's made is uh, indelibly part of the art and contributes to its emotional quality. So this, like, exacting... Uh, technical precise method uh, is part of the emotional tenor that trying to maybe capture the more real than real or sort of that uh, uh, the ability to 
really get at something in this photorealistic way is itself an emotional uh, exercise because it is wanting to be as truthful as possible to this fleeting memory, even though, you know, you can never be uh, possible to this, you know, fleeting moment of time that you're depicting because the thing took you a million years to do. And, you know, in de depicting this fleeting moment of time, it is very artificial as well, which is, you know, a funny quality of that. But it's like you could have used this technique to do your own art, but, you know, you copied somebody else just as like a proof and, you know, it took you years to do it, and I'm, I guess I'm glad you did it, but, you know, it, why not talk more about the subject matter of the artwork or, like, the quality of it that appeals to you? You know, why focus so much on the technical quality unless there wasn't some part of you which felt lesser than for being a technologist in a world of, you know, squishy meat art people, you know, and you were trying to justify something like that? Um, yeah, I, I, and you know, I, I guess I don't necessarily disagree with it, but, um, you know, yeah, there is no reason why technological practices could preclude you from making good art, but it's like, I don't care about that. I just, it's less interesting to me than what is the art about? What, what is the quality of it? What are you trying to convey? What are you trying to communicate? Which in this case, I think takes a back seat to, Oh, how was it made? Which is a great question, a question you should ask, a question which is relevant, but is always less interesting to me than what what's it about, you know? Um, and I think, of course, a technologist would be more interested in how it's made than what it's about, of, of course. And I think, you know, Penn and Teller, these sort of pragmatically minded libertarians who go through, whose, like, whole act is about going through the process of magic, you know, of course... You know, in a way, they present magic as a type of, uh, you know, uh, organic technology in a way um, of, you know, of course, they would find a uh, pause in this message too. that, you know, how it's made is, is just as important as what it's about. And, you know, I guess, you know, in some ways, I agree with them, too, because I'm arguing uh, that how these video games were made just because they had hardware limitations because they had empty space i'm arguing that how it's made is what it's about you know so maybe they're right maybe maybe tim vermeer is correct in that you can never divorce these things the question of what it's about is also informed by how it's made and uh what limitations it's operating with and uh, its technical abilities. So maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I was too quick to judge Tim's Vermeer. But also, like, I would be interested in, like, what does Tim think is interesting? What would he choose to depict? You know, what image would he want to choose for himself that he thinks is worth devoting enough time uh, to, to showing, you know? Because Vermeer wasn't basing that off anything. He chose that image, why did he choose that image? What was he trying... To me, that that is the more interesting question, um, usually. And I think, uh, to push back on what I just previously said, how it's made informs that, but it is not equal in stature to thinking about the ultimate emotional communicative quality of the work, which I think is the primary thing that art is about. Um, and everything else sort of yields to that that primary mode of analysis um what i would also say um, <laughs> um uh in terms of uh how it's made versus what it's about uh is that uh you know it, it, there's this moment in enter the dragon the Bruce Lee movie, Enter the Dragon, where he uh, repeats an old Buddhist saying. Uh, he's teaching a student, and the student is not performing up to Bruce Lee's quality uh, as an instructor. We've just seen a fight scene with Bruce Lee, and we see how he fights, where he's, like, really expressive, and there is a huge amount of, you know, uh, intensity behind his eyes as he fights. And that, you know, supposedly makes him a better fighter as well, because there is, uh, as he goes on to say to a student, it needs emotional content. 
and his student then displays anger but then he says not anger but emotional content for some reason he delineates between anger and emotional content because when i think when he says emotional content he means when you're doing some art or you're putting intent behind something it has to contain every emotion all at once in order to achieve that sort of like holistic good shit that you want out of art um and then he repeats the buddha saying it's like a finger pointing at the moon do not focus on the finger or you'll miss all of that heavenly glory which i i think in its original interpretation was meant to say if you focus too much on like the technical interpretation of teachings in buddhism you will you will miss out on the greater uh, uh the greater uh, nirvana ahead of you because you have become too mired in these sort of uh, minute details. And um, to me, that's sort of what I think about the Tim Vermeer argument as well. It's like, yeah, you should care about the technical ability, but it's a finger pointing at the moon. You know, uh, you, you ultimately the moon is more interesting. The fingers, you know, you know how to get to the moon. I, that's good that's good you see the finger and you know how to get to the moon but also watch the moon watch the goddamn moon um but which is you know funny me saying that because you know <laughs> i've i've talked at length now for how i think that hardware limitations and technical capabilities contribute to the emotional feeling of the game but i would also say at the same time it's interesting how they do that but what is more interesting is that emotional feeling and how would you try and convey that again and say in a modern game where there's a, you have that uh, uh, AAA budget, but also a desire to convey that same sense of melancholy and loneliness that you were bound to earlier because of technical limitations. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think... Uh, that's yeah that's a another big question of and obviously something that i don't have the answer to i err one way but i'm sure the argument the tim's vermeer argument is just as you know it's just as potent i don't discount it i think if you think that way that's perfectly fine but it's not how i think because i am like a squishy organic guy i i do see the horror in being roxas i don't want to be a data stream i want to be meat i am meat i i am made of these sort of electronic things that coalesce in this goopy flesh you know to me that seems that seems real that is my idea for reality and there's a comfort to it i think maybe that's why i like body horror too because it reinforces the idea that we aren't meat we aren't just fleeting streams of data we are this organic thing we are this thing that really exists by virtue of its disgustingness you know, if uh, everything in the digital world is nice and clean and spotless, but we know this world is real because it is filthy. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's the other quality of the emptiness, too. It's like these these worlds, they lack reality because they're not filthy, you know, um, and that contributes to that sense of loneliness and surrealness. Um so yeah, I I don't know where I'm going on with that, but uh, it, this has been a long way of saying that uh, I liked this thing, and it probably isn't going to become uh, a thing again in popular, uh, majorly popular video games because I think there is a a greater expectation for what you consume as being something that has just a lot of stuff in it, um, but. Uh, I'm also here to make the argument there's even like a technical labor argument for making these video games because now with all these AAA games you have this incredible crunch and you have these horrible labor crises where these fucking uh, video game people are killing themselves and bringing them stuff out to uh, market in time for Christmas and shit and if there was an expectation for there to be less stuff in video games uh, then you know that's you, maybe this wouldn't be as much of a problem. Maybe you wouldn't have to be super crunchy all the time. I guess two games that I didn't mention, which I really should mention before uh, I sort of end this, that are very emblematic of the PS1 and PS2 era. Uh, uh, I should say only PS2 era. And another game, you know, talk about a game that directly inspired Dark Souls. Hidetaka Miyazaki has even said as, stuff, as much is Eco, 
and then the follow-up to Eco by the same studio, which is Shadow of the Colossus. But those were games which really used that melancholic emptiness to uh, its advantage in creating that dismal tone. Um, and yeah, uh, there is like a, yeah, a real sadness to these fucking games. And you know that's you know that's the overall mood of Shadow of Colossus too. It's the original game that makes you feel bad for killing the bosses. It's like these gorgeous, gigantic, magnificent creatures, which you have only been given this very shaky motivation as to why you should take down, but you have to do it anyway because you were compelled by the video game. You know, that that idea gets replicated in Elden Ring a lot. I'm sure uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki is very, very influenced by Shadow of the Colossus. Um, but uh, the great thing about Shadow of Colossus, just so much fucking empty space, not so much shit to collect all the time you know just get meditative get 433 you know start thinking about weird stuff as you progress from the one area of action to the other uh and uh i like that i want to see more of that do whoever if there are any games people listening right now do that do a game with a lot of emptiness in it i dare you